Welcome, I'm Danny Level 100, and today on Danny Designs, we're going to be talking about a Gears of War 4 complete story rewrite. As you may know, I'm a big fan of Gears of War. Gears of War 4 is really good in terms of gameplay and mechanics. However, I find the story of this game to be very flawed, lacking any sort of character motivation, development, and most importantly, an emotional core. In this video, what I plan to do is talk about what I would remove from Gears of War 4. What I intend to do is break down how I would redo the story. I plan on highlighting like key moments and cutscenes. And before I begin, I would like to say this video is my opinion. It is going to be a critical piece of media. It is not intended to attack anyone that has worked on Gears of War or Gears of War 4 or anyone currently at the Coalition. I want to show you how I, if I was given the reins to Gears of War, how I would have taken the series in a new direction. And once again, I'm not saying that I am flawless or perfect or that the story and alterations I made are going to be the best. In fact, I am expecting some people who watch this video to see the changes I make and to completely disagree and that is completely fine and I am okay with that. With all that being said, here is how I would rewrite Gears of War 4. First things first, let's talk about what I would have removed or altered in Gears of War 4's story and lore. First off, I want to get rid of the Fabricator. The Fabricator is something that I felt that completely broke the lore of Gears of War. If you watch my previous videos, you know that the Fabricator is something that, to me, works as a gameplay mechanic, but it doesn't work in the context of the game's campaign. A major change I would make would be to have Gears of War 4 allow for 4 player co-op. One thing you are going to notice when I write the story is that there will always be the three main characters, JD, Dell, and Kate, but they will always be joined by a fourth character for every mission. This would allow for 4 player co-op if need be. Gears of War 4 is not about war, it's about the start of a conflict. It's about humanity finally being at peace after a long war with the Locust, and suddenly, humanity is once again threatened by a familiar enemy known as the Swarm. In the previous Gears of War games, we always start in the middle of the war. Setting the game over the course of a week rather than over the course of a night would drastically improve the overall feel of this game. One character I would try to improve on would be the COG's leader, Jin. Jin and her COG command don't seem to even realize the swarm exists until the very end of the game. One of the problems I have with this game overall is that the COG and the DBs, they're all portrayed to be very incompetent. The fact that four people on motorcycles shot down a plane with submachine guns just adds to it, and it kind of cements the COG as not being involved in this game or this conflict at all. And another big element I would change would be the Locust 2.0, aka the Swarm. The concept of the Locust becoming crystallized and metamorphosing into the Swarm is a little lame. I don't think it's an absolute terrible idea, but it just feels like the writers were too afraid to change up the enemy of the game. And I don't blame them because the Locusts are such an iconic enemy. In my story, I wouldn't get rid of the Swarm, but I would alter them a little bit to make them a pawn for the new enemy faction that I want to introduce. And to build on that, I would get rid of the DBs as an enemy almost entirely. You combat the DBs for about two and a half hours of the game, and the game is only about five hours long. One big change I'd make would be to completely remove the idea of the Wind Flares. The Wind Flares are just there for no other reason aside from eye candy and visual flair, but overall I felt that their inclusion was kind of pointless. I know they tried to include some game mechanics with them that debris can be used to take out enemies or certain weapons would be affected by the wind, but it's an idea that is just really flimsy, it doesn't do anything for the story, and it's barely touched upon gameplay-wise. A huge aspect of the story that I would change would be to remove any relation between Reyna and Kate and the Locust Queen. Personally, it feels like one of the most convoluted plot points and completely unnecessary. Personally, I don't like when a sequel or prequel feels obligated to make a connection. Having Reyna and Kate being related to the Locust Queen doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't feel earned either. There's nothing that really builds up to it, it's just a reveal at the end of the game. Making Kate related to the Locust Queen is going to give us some relevancy in Gears of War 5, I suppose. And with the way the writers are approaching this game, I wonder how they're going to even explain that in Gears of War 5. Overall, one of my biggest complaints is that the characters don't have any character and there's no real character development at all with any of them. No character goes through any sort of change or growth. JD and his friends are the same people they always were from the start of the game to the end of the game. 
And with all that being said, it's time for me to present to you my version of Gears of War. Prologue, Cogs in the Machine. On the outskirts of a cog settlement, we see a group of cog squads patrolling through the forest. They're on a mission to capture raiders who have been stealing from a nearby cog settlement. Leading the formation of the squads is two unknown cog soldiers, one male and one female, and two male soldiers, Dell and JD. As they approach the forest, the soldiers come across a small encampment of raiders, not yet known to the players as the outsiders. The squad commander tells his men to get ready as they have orders to capture the outsider leader although deadly force is allowed if necessary. Unbeknownst to the members in the player's squad, Cog High Command is using this as an opportunity to test their latest combat DB variant. Cog High Command gives the squad the order to attack. From this point on, players take control of the squad, player one JD, player two Dell, and player three and four as the other two unnamed soldiers. The player is assisted by their fellow soldiers and DBs. During the battle, JD and Dell comment on how the COG are just outright slaughtering the outsiders. The DBs in particular take no prisoners, shooting and killing unarmed outsiders without any hesitation. JD and Dell witness a DB execute a surrendering outsider. They are disgusted with what they see, but they are ordered to continue on with the mission. JD and Dell's squad pushes ahead, and soon enough, they're on the trail of the encampment's leader. After another shootout with the outsider forces, the player will corner the leader, who is revealed to be Oscar. JD and Dell radio in that they have captured the leader. Oscar will then yell at them, saying that the cog has lost their way, it's changed. That now the cog is just a fascist dictatorship. JD and Dell are stunned, and the squad leader tells them to kill Oscar over the radio. JD and Dell hesitate, as the mission was to capture him. From behind JD and Dell, a couple of DBs emerge from the forest and approach their captured prisoner. They raise their weapons as they move in to execute Oscar. Suddenly, a girl runs out from hiding and embraces Oscar. This is Kate. She cries out for them to not kill her uncle. The DBs continue to aim as the squad commander barks orders at JD and Dell. JD and Dell then take aim at the DBs and dispatch them quickly. JD and Dell watch Oscar and Kate flee into the forest as their squad leader yells at them through the radio in their helmets. End of prologue. Act 1. Time and time again. A year has passed since the prologue. JD and Dell have now joined the Outsiders and are staking out a COG settlement with Kate and Oscar. The COG settlement they were staking out was currently under construction, most likely only a few guards and some security DBs on patrol. Inside, they would find plenty of supplies that the Outsiders desperately need. As the squad makes their way inside the settlement, they quickly notice that there isn't a lot of activity going on. In fact, it seems that the construction has been completely halted. They find signs of a struggle, but no signs of any COG soldiers. As the squad makes their way through the settlement, they continue to gather all the supplies they need. This alerts a few security DBs, resulting in a couple shootouts as they make their quick getaway. Along the way, there's telltale signs of some sort of struggle. There's footprints that are unrecognizable, but nothing's adding up or making any sense. With all the supplies gathered, the squad travels back to their outsider village. And with the cutscene, we see the squad make it safely back to the outsider village, where we're introduced to Reyna, the leader of the outsiders. The supplies are distributed amongst the people, and Reyna asks how the mission went. And the squad lets her know about what happened. They don't think too much of it, and they go on with their day. Later on at night, Kate, JD, and Dell are relaxing. Suddenly, screams and gunshots fill the night as a new enemy reveals itself. These, of course, are Pouncers and Snatchers. Switching back to gameplay, JD, Dell, and Kate run out and grab the nearest weapons they can find. They run into Reyna, who is rallying all of her troops to fight against these creatures. Switching back to gameplay, the squad must make their way through the village, attempting to rescue any villagers and defeat as many creatures as possible. With the outsider village lost, Reyna will order Oscar and the squad to find a nearby COG outpost and alert them of this new enemy. Reyna says she will take all the survivors to another village and that they will regroup later. And with that, the squad heads out to find the nearest COG base. The squad arrives at a nearby COG base. The COG base also appears to have been attacked. The squad moves in to investigate. After a short shootout with the swarm, the squad encounters COG survivors. One of these COG soldiers happens to be JD and Dell's former friend and drill sergeant, Jace Braddon. There's little time to catch up as the soldiers quickly come up with a plan to reach the radio tower so they may contact New Impera to let them know of the new swarm threat. The squads work together, quickly making their way through the compound, 
get into many shootouts and skirmishes with the swarm. Finally, they're able to take the radio tower and contact the cog capital. However, it seems that New Impera is well aware of the threat and is currently being overwhelmed with refugees from nearby cog settlements. Jace decides to lead his remaining squad back to New Impera via a convoy of pack horses or cog humvees. JD, Dell, and Kate decide to go with them, and Oscar decides to stay behind and go back to meet up with Reyna. The next chapter in this act is an on-rail segment where the players must man the turrets of the pack horses to fend off swarm snatchers and pouncers. After the sequence has been completed, Act 1 comes to an end with the pack horses driving off into the night on the way to the cog capital of New Impera. Act 2, Backs to the Wall. The convoy arrives at the walls of New Impera. JD is awoken by Kate, gently rocking his shoulder. The pack horses are lit through the main gate. The main gates to the city are in complete disarray. There are thousands of civilians here, all from nearby cog settlements. Jace and his squad disembark from the pack horses. As they search for the nearest commanding officer, JD, Dal, and Kate run into Damon Baird, who is talking to Cog Command over the radio. They plead with him to deploy military DB units, but he argues against that. Amongst the refugees, there are Shepherd DB units assisting people, carrying luggage, providing blankets, helping construct shelters. Baird says the DBs were invented just for this exact purpose. Baird is surprised to see JD and Dell and they quickly catch up as they walk through the camp. Baird comments how JD and Dell are technically fugitives as they went AWOL over a year ago. He also asks JD if he's spoken to his father, and JD replies that he hasn't spoken to his father in just over five years, sometime after he graduated from the military academy. Baird also mentions that he needs to get to his lab on the other side of the city. He wants to get there to retrieve his files and equipment. The city is suddenly set upon by the invaders, Gears scramble as Jace leads a squad to help evacuate and defend the refugees. Baird tells JD, Dell, and Kate to suit up as they're going to have to fight their way through the city to get to his lab. JD, Dell, and Kate remove their civilian clothing and get into some basic cog armor so they can blend in and have better protection in the upcoming firefight. During this first mission, the first few blocks are just refugees and citizens scrambling to get away from the sounds of roars and gunfire. Dell comments that the DBs would be very useful now. Baird reiterates that they are not for combat. After all the refugees have passed, the squad works their way into the city, getting into shootouts with invader drones and swarm beasts. The squad passes through multiple war zones, helping numerous COG soldiers along the way. Over the radio, Sam Byrne keeps the squad informed on the whereabouts of the invader forces. The squad finally reaches their destination. It is here that Baird reveals to them that he has been tracking these invaders for the last few months. At first, he had no idea what they were, but slowly, he was able to identify them as a completely new threat from outer space. Satellite images captured strange lights and detected a mothership being built right outside the Saren Wilds. Baird downloads his research and sends it to Cog High Command. He thanks the squad for their help as they leave the lab they're informed over the radio that all squads are to meet in the town square. Before they can make their way to the town square, the lab is attacked. Baird tells the squad to take control of one of the drone units in his lab. The players can pick between a Kestrel helicopter, a COG Silverback, or two DB Guardian units. After the squad is able to defeat the invaders, they're able to travel to the city square. Baird uses his clearance to get into Prime Minister Jin's office. Before entering, he tells the squad to put on their helmets so they're not recognized. Inside her office, we find First Minister Jin talking with Kong generals who are scrambling to deal with the influx of refugees and plan a proper counterattack against the invading forces. The attack on the city was successfully repelled, but the city is not defensible and will not be able to stand a long siege. Baird presents his findings to her, and the generals decide the best thing to do would be to launch a counteroffensive on Tolan Dam, where the invader ship was seen landing. While disguised as a cog soldier, Kate asks Jin if they should contact the outsiders for reinforcements. Jin is very dismissive of this suggestion, and orders her generals to begin mobilizing on Tolan Dam. As they leave Jin's office, Kate is able to reach the outsiders on their secret radio frequency. Rainer and Oscar have been able to evacuate their communities, but many have also been displaced. Kate tells Reyna that the COG are unwilling to work with them, and Reyna tells Kate to stay where she's at as it's too dangerous to reconnect. The squad minus Baird board a King Raven helicopter as they are now part of the counterattack that will take place at Tolan Dam. On the flight there, JD recounts a tale his father once told him. 
about how Tolan Dam was one of the only sources of power during the Locust War. It was able to keep the Cog War Machine thriving during the early days and the Locusts soon advanced on it. Deers were sent to defend the dam, and for a time they did. Unfortunately, the Locusts began to overwhelm them until they ran out of supplies, which led to the defenders starving and slowly dying, which ultimately led to the dam falling into the Locusts' hands. The squad arrives at the dam, and the Cog have already set up a forward operating base. However, the invaders the swarm onto the Cog base, leading to a chaotic battle. Kate, Dale, and JD head into the dam to take cover, Inside, they find themselves cut off from the rest of the forces. The Cog are scattered but not defeated as they hold up against the invader forces. The squad runs into Augustus Cole, the sole survivor of his squad, who has also taken refuge inside the dam. The squad devises a plan to traverse the dam through the underground tunnels. They figure that they might be able to regroup the Cog forces and join the main offensive on the inside. Traveling through the subterranean tunnels, they encounter heavy resistance. As the squad battles their way through the dam, they're able to restore the power and soon discover the swarm are a part of a larger scheme. Inside the dam is an alien facility, the mothership, and the squad manages to get on board and discover a lab with signs of the swarm being engineered by the invader forces. They discover a pod room full of pods from snatchers and inside are human prisoners that are being harvested. Through this, they're able to piece together that the swarm are genetically engineered race of warriors that are built from human and locust DNA. The Pouncer, Snatcher, and Carrier are all creatures created to do the bidding of these invaders. Inside the lab, the squad comes face to face with the aliens. These invaders are tall, lanky, and have armored plates resembling that of their beasts. These aliens are the real masterminds behind the invasion. The squad fights their way out of the facility. As they make their way through the tunnels, they are attacked by a giant tentacle. Thinking that it is solely a, a single creature, they follow it until they realize it's not just one creature, but the tip of an iceberg. The tentacle belongs to a giant creature, a hive beast, that the invaders have been growing for their master plan. The squad is finally able to make their way out, and in the lab, JD discovered that the aliens are planning on advancing their hive beast in a direction that will overtake cities, forests, and, and ultimately the Stroud Estates, where his father lives. JD says that he must save his father, but Cole reminds them they need to stay at the dam. JD tells Kate and Dell that he must save his father. He makes a run for an APC. As he boards the APC, JD and Kate join him, leaving Cole behind. The Cog try to stop them, but are unable to. And as the APC speeds off, the dam begins to collapse. The Hive Beast emerges, killing and destroying many of the Cog's forces. And as the APC speeds off into the night, Act 2 comes to an end. Act 3, The Pariah. The APC arrives at the Stroud Estates. The squad slowly makes their way up towards the mansion. They find the doors unlocked. JD walks through the den where he finds his former childhood home in a state of disarray. As they walk around, they can't seem to find any sign of Marcus Phoenix. Kate suggests that he might have already ran off. Eventually, the squad finds Marcus sitting alone in his den. JD and Marcus have a tense yet emotional reunion. He urges his father to leave his home as the invaders and their hive beast are on their way. Marcus is adamant about staying at the mansion. Marcus said he already made up his mind. If the mansion is to be destroyed, then he plans to go down with it. He tells JD and his friends to leave, but JD says he can't abandon his father. Marcus gives JD and company a new set of armor as they prepare their defenses. A few hours go by and the swarm arrive. The squad sets up defenses at the outer perimeter. As the waves continue, they begin to overwhelm them until they fall back and defend the interior of the mansion. The swarm begin to surround the Stroud Estates, and the battle seems lost. However, they are suddenly joined by the Outsiders. The battle continues as they push the swarm away from the mansion, and even more reinforcements arrive in the form of COG DBs. Baird provides air cover via a Kestrel drone, and COG units begin to move in. The COG and the Outsider forces give the squad enough time to establish a foothold for propelling the invaders. The squad reconnects with Baird, Jace, Cole, and Sam, and they inform Marcus that the Hive Beast is making its way towards them. They come up with a plan to ambush it as it travels through a canyon, combining their forces to destroy it. The Cog and the Outsiders put their plan in motion. Baird brought a couple mechs from his lab as he figured they might be useful. At this point, two players can get inside the mechs and two players can pilot the, the Kestrel drones remotely. From this point forward, two players can get inside of one of the mech suits and pilot the Kestrel drones remotely, providing air support and cover for the mechs. 
As they make their way down to the canyon to confront the hive beasts, the players must assist their allies along the way and keep the invaders and swarm off one another. After a long battle, they manage to kill the swarm beasts with the combined efforts of the outsiders and cog forces. The swarm and invaders march is halted. The cog and outsiders celebrate this victory. JD and his friends are overjoyed. Marcus tells JD he's proud of him and gives him a warm embrace. Everything seems well until the cog arrests JD and Dell for going AWOL. The game ends as JD and Dell let themselves be escorted away, all the while the invaders regroup and prepare for the next battle. And that is how I would rewrite Gears of War 4, and I hope you guys liked it. And if you didn't, I would love to hear from you. Leave any questions, comments, or concerns down below in the comment section here. And hey, if I get enough of them, maybe I'll do a follow-up video where I can answer some of your questions. Just so you know, all sources for all the footage and concept art I used will be linked down below as well. There's a ton of great concept art here from very talented people at the Coalition, so please check it out. And if you want more of me, check me out on Twitch. Here's all my social media accounts. I just made an Instagram as well. And I just want to say a big thank you and shout out for everybody for watching. And I'll see you guys later. Take care. Goodbye.